Justice Tech Pros here. Today I wanted to talk about and discuss the concept of pleas and when a person takes a plea. And again, the public perception of that is if an individual takes a plea, they're guilty of the crimes because they're admitting to the crimes. And again, that's a textbook concept. That's something that in theory one would think is accurate. Because in theory, you wouldn't plead to something unless you're guilty based on the fact that if you weren't guilty and you were innocent and you go to trial, you would be found innocent because you're innocent, right? Makes sense. But as we all know, that's not the reality of things. You could be innocent and go to trial and you could be found guilty because of the fact that you didn't get a fair trial. All of the things discussed in prior episodes took place, whereas it limited the defendant to have a quality trial, or you have uneducated jurors on the panel, or you have jurors who don't possess common sense, or you have a judge who is not going to allow the trial to play out in a fair manner. All of those things are the reality of what a person may consider when they even decide to take a plea. And that must be a really um, uneasy feeling for somebody to even have to contemplate taking a plea when they're 100% innocent. And when you look at it rationally, you could see the logic behind it. I mean, just think of it in an analytical standpoint. You're faced with, let's say, five years. We take the five years, you get it over with, and you move on with your life, versus, let's say, 25 years. You're risking 25 years. You're almost gambling with your life based on the fact that you would not get the 25 years or get any time as long as you get a fair trial because you know you're innocent. Then you take a step back and you realize, what are the odds of getting a fair trial? Trial. Look at all the variables that have to take place. You have to make sure you have a fair and unbiased uh, judge. You have to make sure you have an educated jury panel. You have to make certain that you're going to be able to present the case as you have it laid out or mapped out how defense counsel had strategized during pretrial. And during uh, trial preparation, you have to guarantee that the plans that everyone came up with and everything that you plan on introducing is going to get introduced and, and is going to be permissible. There's a lot of factors there that have to go 100% smoothly to make certain that a defendant receives that fair trial. So when you're faced with that, any logical person would have to think about that. And even though you're innocent, sometimes you have to weigh the less of the two evils or the potential adverse effects if things do not result in the way that they're hypothetically mapped out to result. Whereas you're supposed to be innocent to proving guilty. You're supposed to get a fair trial. You're supposed to have a jury of your peers. Yes, if all those things were a reality, then I really doubt anybody who was guilty would plead plea um, who is innocent would plea guilty but that's not a reality as we discussed in you know in prior episodes that's a fantasy and this is actually a concept that has statistical backing to it whereas I'm not off base I was going through a few reports and just to just to cite some of the examples Whereas what I am saying has weight to it. There's a site called guiltypleaproblem.org. And they actually talk about that. It's all people who have pled guilty even though they were innocent. There's um, per percentages. They have a percentage of known, this is known, exonerees. So people who were exonerated after they pled guilty to crimes they didn't commit was at 18%. So 18% of exonerees, of people who wound up getting exonerated, 
were exonerated even though they pled guilty. So they were innocent pleading guilty. 95% of felony convictions in the U.S. are obtained through guilty pleas. So that's why they have such a high conviction rate is because people look to, to plea out. And again, I'm not saying this is something that, you know, oh, everybody who pleads is innocent. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying, though, is that if one innocent person pleads guilty, there's a flaw. There's a reason for that, and there's a problem. And if that person is ple pleading to something they did not do simply because they are scared of the reality, which is a, a, a frightening reality, that they will not get a, a fair trial, that's a huge problem. Innocent people are, are going to jail admitting to things they have never done, uh, swearing to them in open court just to have the less of the two evils play out, just so they eventually have a life again. Is that justice? Absolutely not. And yet it's, it's not at the forefront of acknowledging there's a problem and somebody looking to fix that problem and change it. Obviously, something's broke if that's taking place. Something's broke. So, I started digging a little bit, and, and if, you, if you simply just research plea and innocent, you'll come up with a ton of results. But there was um, a few articles that I wanted to spotlight. One of them was from Forbes magazine. As July 31st, 2018, are innocent people pleading guilty? A new report says yes. And the article goes on to pretty much discuss what I laid out, whereas the punishment is so severe versus the plea offer on the table, innocent people don't want to risk it based on the belief that they're not going to get a fair trial. The opening paragraph reads as follows. Defendants in federal cases face life-changing choices once they have been charged. Plead guilty and take a less severe penalty or exercise their right to a trial and risk years, decades in prison. It is no wonder that some have pondered whether innocent people are pleading guilty to crimes they did not commit. And then it goes on to say how the NACDL published a paper that's titled The Trial Penalty, The Sixth Amendment Right to Trial on the Verge of Extinction and How to Save It. And it goes on to really much explain how the trial penalty on a lot of these pleas are, is so severe that defendants just simply don't want to take the risk. And they plea to something they never did. And they've, they're actually reading allocutions and statements stating that they committed crimes that they never did commit. And I want to just read another passage. Uh, I don't want to bore you and just read you know, all these articles, but this passage uh, is important. It struck a nerve. So it goes, and it's from the same paper, and it starts, Guilty pleas have replaced trials for a very simple reason. Individuals who choose to exercise their Sixth Amendment right to trial face exponentially higher sentences if they are if they invoke the right to trial and lose faced with this choice individuals almost uniformly surrender the right to trial rather than insist on proof beyond a reasonable doubt defense lawyers spend most of their time negotiating guilty pleas rather than ensuring that police and the government respect the boundaries of the law including the proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard and judges dedicate their time to administering plea allocutions rather than evaluating the constitutional and legal aspects of the government's case and police conduct. Equally important, the public rarely exercises the oversight function envisioned by the framers and inherent in jury service. I mean, that really says a mouthful there, and, and it sums up a lot of what took place, takes place especially about the judges dedicating their time uh, more so on the plea allocutions rather than evaluating constitutional and legal aspects of the government's case and police conduct or any law enforcement conduct. That's really where their focus should be. And it's a sobering 
paper in the sense that this is being put out there. There are people taking pleas that are 100% innocent and they're plea pleading because they just know they cannot get a fair trial. A fair trial. And how, uh, how scary is that? Especially in this country, you would think one of the benefits of this country is we are going to get a fair trial. And that's just not the reality. And that's the whole problem in a nutshell. These things are not the reality, and it's a giant snowball effect. Because of all these things, people are starting trial against the eight ball. They're not innocent until proven guilty. They're guilty till proven innocent. And they don't have to meet the threshold of reasonable doubt, where a jury just needs a little bit of reasonable doubt. No, the jury now is flipping it, where they feel if they just believe a little that they're guilty... Even though they have doubt, they're still going to convict. That's what's happening. Juries are not understanding what their obligations are, and what their job is, and what their duty is. Some judges are not making sure trials are going fairly. Some law enforcement agencies are not doing things properly and using credible witnesses and using factual evidence, but rather making up evidence and making things fit, making the puzzles fit. They're trying to put fit. They're trying to put square pegs in round holes. And unfortunately, the government has a monster hammer, so they're able to smash those square pegs right into those round holes and make them fit. And the jury buys it. They eat it up. And what's frustrating is you get, before the trial even starts, all of these factors are working against the defendant. And for an innocent person, man or woman, to even have to contemplate pleading to something they did not do because they're just not going to risk the reality of the justice system and what could potentially happen and potentially ruin their lives. They just don't want to risk that. So they have to go sit in a jail cell for years, however long it is, for something they didn't do, just to go through the system, just so the government could get their conviction, because they just didn't have the confidence that justice would be served. And unfortunately, that plays out to be the right decision a lot of the time, because they're just not going to get a fair trial. I mean, just going through, you know, a lot of the headlines recently, you see a lot of these headlines and you could see what makes the big headlines and what makes the big stories and what doesn't. You know, it's amazing. You get, you get some of these priests and some of these pedophiles that do horrible things to children and you really don't see a lot about it. You see a little blurb here, a little, but if you get somebody who's supposedly a, a member of an Italian uh, secret society, it hits every paper you could think of. Why do you think that is? Because right from the start, they're looking to subliminally send messages into the public's mind that these individuals are guilty. So when and if the time comes for trial, they'll already have that seed planted. You could tell by the headlines, you could tell by the stories, you could tell by the press releases that are put out. Why are there no press releases put out on uh, going after... Uh, known pedophiles, or known rapists, degenerate crimes, degenerate criminals. You never see press releases on that kind of thing. But if they make a big arrest with all these various uh, alleged secret societies, it's plastered everywhere. Why do you think that is? And this isn't a conspiracy theorist thing. This isn't me trying, oh, there's a big conspiracy. That's not at all. This is reality. I'm not, you know, this isn't something I'm just thinking up just open up the newspapers and look just go through things you'll see for yourself i'm not trying to convince anybody this is fact and take you know take personal feelings and and judgments out of the equation just go by the fact why would one think that is why would one think that's the case because they're trying to plant certain seeds into the public and it's always within the region, you know, obviously, you're going to cover a story that's within the region, but that's to start to taint the jury pool from early on. This way, down the road, you start getting those jurors after you've run story after story after story. The defendants brought into court, they're already going against the grain at that point in time. 
from the moment they show up in court, they're already going against the grain. And these are all things, that, these are all calculated moves. This isn't coincidence. These things are done intentionally, and they're calculated. And strategically, these are smart plays. You know, the government's making smart plays because, you know, they're, they're tipping the scales in their favor without really having to do much. It's just putting out press releases, feeding stories. But that's a problem. That's a problem because all those things contribute to someone contemplating, pleading to something that they're 100% innocent of. All those are contributing factors. When you have all those different things ingrained into a potential juror's mindset, how are you going to counteract that? How are you going to wipe that out? It's almost impossible to rid somebody of that prejudice if they have that in their head already. And this goes for a lot of different people, a lot of different groups, a lot of, it's just the way it plays out. And that's a problem. That's a major problem. And, you know, a lot of it has to go back to, you know, who that agency decides to target. You know, really, it was funny because I was watching a, um, a documentary on this this um, yoga instructor, an Indian guru yoga yoga instructor, his name was Bikram Chowdhury. And what I found interesting was at the end, you know, this guy turned out to be a real <clears throat> low life. He was, uh, you know, teaching his class of this hot yoga where, you know, he had everybody doing yoga in like 120 degrees and he was uh, forcing himself on a lot of his students just... A real uh, scurve of a guy. <clears throat> and at the end, it said how they chose not even to... The guy fled the country because he wound up getting sued by all his victims. And at the end, it said how they chose, you know, law enforcement and the prosecution, they chose to, to really not pursue it, not to have him extradited, not to file criminal charges against him. And the guy's out and about. He's in another country now doing the same thing all over again. And that really drove home the fact of importance and priorities. So in other words, women getting uh, put in positions where they're vulnerable and then getting taken advantage of, that's not important to law enforcement. That's not a, a threat, um, a danger to society. You know, they don't consider that a danger to society. But yet, if they decided to target someone, they would do everything in their power to extradite them, to charge them, to bring them to justice. They would get them indicted immediately. As I echoed in my prior episode, you can indict a ham sandwich. They could get an indictment on this guy very quickly. But it's obvious where the priorities are. It's not, it's not something on their radar. It's not something that, I don't know, I don't know what the reasoning, the rationale behind it is. I just look at it like it doesn't make the headlines. It's not something they really care about they focus on other things and to me it makes no sense when you see the vendettas they have against other people that aren't doing these degenerate crimes and yet they'll go through all lengths to frame people to set people up to bring in informants that don't even know the defendants but have them say certain things just to find them guilty They'll go through all of these steps. They'll, they'll, they'll investigate somebody 20 years. They'll go through all these steps just to obtain an arrest and then a potential guilty verdict. But yet things like this are just let go. And I'm sure there's a, a lot more of these type of things. This one just stuck out to me because, as I said, they did a documentary on it. And it's quite disturbing. And the general public doesn't see that. That's what's even more concerning because that's the only shot society has to right this wrong of the justice system. To get it back on track, society does have the power to do that. And it really doesn't have to take place at the judicial level or at the level of Congress where they have to... It doesn't have to take place at that level. It really doesn't. It'd be great if it did. That would make things a lot easier, but that process is too slow. And I'm a very impatient person. 
So I think the best way to, to change it is start now with society and with, with potential jury pools and with educating the public and waking them up to what is taking place. The public needs to educate themselves on what their responsibilities will be and what takes place and see how these things are playing out. And it all ties into one another. I mean, you get people that there's no violence in the charges. And I, I was reading something yesterday, unfortunately. And this individual was held without bail. And yet, what justifies that? They're not a danger to society based on the charges. They're not a flight risk based on how vested they are within their community and the families that they have. It, it, and it just doesn't make any sense. There's no justifiable reason for that other than the fact that they targeted this person and now they want to make their life very hard. And we're talking, what, three weeks before the holidays? And you're not going to give somebody bail who's not a danger to society and doesn't present a flight risk simply because a judge decides, I don't want to give him bail? And that's justifiable? That's another item that really needs a, a look at. I mean, what, what should constitute bail conditions? You would have to prove that you are a danger in some way by past, where the general public suffered in one way or another. And then you'll hear these cases of known uh, pedophiles and known rapists and lowlives who are granted bail, and then they get out, and they repeat, and they hurt somebody else, a new victim. That's somebody who's a danger to community. I mean, you have somebody who picks out random people and preys on them like a predator. That's a danger to, com to a community. You're holding somebody on bail based on a racketeering charge or you're not giving them bail. How is that a danger to the community? How does a citizen ever suffer based on that? From what I read on a lot of these things, it's an internal process. These crimes are committed internally, allegedly. How do you justify keeping somebody incarcerated during their proceedings simply because you want to give them a title or you want to tie them to some alleged organization without being able to prove they're a danger to society in any way? It's a different stigma. It's really a different set of rules when you're a target. And again, how is that just? Forget about, forget about how you feel about different groups or... But you just have to go by what's justified and what's reality. For example, you have a terrorist. That's a danger to society. That's a low-life danger to society. That's somebody who could harm the public, harm the American people. You want to detain them? That makes sense. But I've read stories. I mean, you could even uh, search stories of terrorists who made bail. That's insanity. Granted, some of the bails were high. I believe one was $5 million. It doesn't matter. That's insanity. Shouldn't even have the option. But you won't give bail to someone who has a charge of racketeering? Uh, that's, uh, I don't know how that makes any sense. And you can't create a bail condition just to placate the fact that you're going to eliminate having a danger of society out. There's, home, there's house arrest. There's ankle bracelets. There's a lot they could do. They just don't want to do it. They want to make that per they were the target, so they want to make that person's life as hard and as miserable as possible. And that's just not justice. It's not, and that's not innocent till proven guilty. That's for sure. That's not innocent till proven guilty. That's you're guilty and we're holding you. Now prove your innocence. So for the public not to realize that concept on an action such as that alone. There's a huge disconnect from reality and from fantasy. For some reason, the general public is not seeing the reality of these things. And I, and I truly believe the problem, going back to the problem of individuals taking a plea when they're innocent, is another huge problem that's just not being addressed. It's just not. And that's because there's so much leeway on meeting the threshold of charging these people. Because it's so easy to get an indictment. 
I mean, it's so easy to indict somebody. Now you have them in the system. So now this person realizes, wow, I'm indicted and I was innocent. So I'm already innocent and, I'm, and I got indicted based on being innocent. So right there, you know, there's a problem. Right there, you know, there's an error in the system. And again, this isn't something that I'm pulling from thin air. It's all over the place. Just look up exonerees, look up people who are innocent, people who did time. It's all over the news. It's everywhere if you, if you look for it. So this, these are facts. These people were innocent and they got indicted. That shows you right there you could throw the whole indictment process out the window. Especially with such a high percentage of it. Something like that should be less than 1%. And it's not. It's way more than that. And even less than 1% is unacceptable. But I'm just being realistic where his problems happen and things slip through the cracks. But if the percentage it's at where innocent people are being found guilty, innocent people are being having to plead guilty, all because the initial indictment was flawed. An innocent person was indicted when they never should have been indicted in the first place. So they're going through all these struggles, financial burdens, emotional burdens, physical burdens, all based on obviously lies because they wouldn't have got indicted if lies didn't take place. But now they find themselves in this predicament and now they find themselves having to fight for their life when they did nothing wrong. How is that justice? And how is anybody with, with any kind of logic and common sense going to not realize that? Hearing all these things and knowing all these things should automatically put the general public in the mindset, whereas the government, the law enforcement, whoever's bringing the charges, whatever department's bringing the charges against the defendant, their burden of proof should be super high. And they really should take serious the reasonable doubt, and they really should hold them accountable. It should be the other way. Whereas it, it, it should be the real way, innocent to proven guilty. And it should be, jurors should look at it, well, if they brought them here, they better prove their case. They better prove beyond a reasonable doubt this individual or these individuals are guilty. They have all the resources, they have all the time, they have all the manpower. It better be perfect. It should be perfect. Especially when you're dealing with the federal government. I mean, they have endless money, endless time. It should be flawless. There's no, no reason anything should be shady or, or anything should be manipulated or uh, informants should be fed stories or informants should be lying. None of that should take place. It should be a flawless prosecution with all the evidence proving their case that's how it should play out. They should be held to the highest of standards when you're looking to end somebody's life. And why doesn't it play out that way? Because the jury is not educated. They're just not. And they're fooled by the smoke and mirrors. And they buy into all the subliminal messages that have been sent prior about innocent to proven guilty and they're going to get a fair trial and if they're indicted there had to be a reason why they're indicted and if they're sitting here they're buying into all of that fantasy world and that's not the re reality and that's where the cycle has to be broke that's where it has to take place that has to stop that whole train of thinking that what's written in the textbooks is a reality has to stop the public and the, and the potential juries have to open their mind. They have to look at what's really taking place, forget about what's written down, go by what's really taking place, and then treat the situations like that. And the same with the judges. When it comes time, if you have somebody in front of you that pled guilty, and it comes time to sentence them, you really should take everything into account. You know, take everything into account. Before you, you hand down that sentence. Really decide if you think that person's guilty. Or if you're dealing with somebody who's innocent. And had their back up against the wall. And had no options because they lost faith in the criminal justice system. And this is where they're at. Because they just want to get it behind them and move on. All those things should play into your mind before you hand down that sentence. In good conscience alone. You should realize if you're dealing with... The judges are very, very educated people, very intelligent, and they should know what's in front of them. They shouldn't buy into any of the uh, 
stigmas or any of the nonsense that goes on. They should deal with it each case by case and assess what took place. And that's all part of the problem. You have judges not doing that. You have juries not understanding what the reality is. And it all leads to this mess where you have poor people that are now stuck in the system, dealing with hardship, fighting for their life when they never even committed a crime. Or you got people who in their past may have pled to things and that's being used against them. So in other words, they're saying, well, if you were guilty back then, you're guilty now. You can't change. Uh, there's no such thing as changing. Now, who are they to judge that? Prove it. You could think whatever you want about somebody, but you got to prove it. In reality, you're supposed to have to prove it, but that's not the case lately. People are getting found guilty just based on beliefs, based on past beliefs, based on who you think a person may have been when they were younger, what they may have done when they were younger. That's not how it works. You have to find somebody guilty based on what the evidence shows now and what the charges are now. And that's definitely not happening. I can tell you firsthand that's definitely not happening. The cases I've experienced, that's not the, not the case at all. That's not taking place. It's just not. And I'm sure all these juries, when they convict somebody, they go home with smiles on their faces under the delusion that justice was served. And they're really delusional. You know, I'm wondering if there's leprechauns and, you know, flying unicorns at the house when they get home because they're living in a fantasy world. Because they're living in their own delusional. And if they think they're serving justice, they have no idea what they're talking about. And they're only fooling themselves and they're buying into the whole smoke and mirrors. And they're just as bad as any injustice that took place to get that indictment or all the lies and all the the um i don't even want to call them witnesses because they're not but all the liars i should say that come up and testify and act as if they were a witness the juror is just as bad as them because they're buying that you know you have what's called juror nullification which basically if you're going to bring up this trash and you're going to lie to me it negates anything that you're going to tell me and there's nothing wrong in that concept because it's like I said, if the government's bringing a case, it better be flawless. And if you're going to put up liars and you're going to, uh, and I'm going to see all these holes in your case where evidence was twisted and conversations were twisted and audio was, uh, transcripts were manipulated and words were intentionally not transcribed but left out, they, they put what's called UI, unintelligible. With the equipment they have, you're telling me they can't enhance that? My firm can enhance that. We can enhance that and, and clear things up. There were so many unintelligibles on cases that we were able to enhance, enhance and clear up, which of course helped the defendant. When you leave it unintelligible, which is UI, it hurts the defendant, of course. But coincidentally, once it's enhanced and you make out the word, of course it's a benefit to the defendant. And then when you pre present that, now they're not going to use it, obviously. But before you were able to clear it up, oh, they were using that transcript. That was being submitted. And now when you make these arguments in court and you show these things, the jury doesn't take notice of that. The jury doesn't realize if these things are being manipulated, what else was manipulated? And that's what's frightening. The general public has to wake up, and, I, and I'm just hoping this podcast takes off for that purpose alone. I don't benefit from this podcast. It is, this isn't really part of my business. This is separate and apart. This is a project I wanted to do on my own. Uh, my business, as I've explained, focuses on supporting counsel and supporting the law firms and e-discovery and and uncovering things that can help the case and build the case. So this really doesn't, we don't really deal with the general public. Um, we deal with the, with the lawyers and the firms. And then in that, you know, once we're brought on, then we mediate and we do interact with the, uh, you know, clients. We'll, we'll visit them if they're incarcerated. We'll bring them up to speed. We communicate with the family, just what's going on. Just important things to keep them in the loop. But we don't look to obtain 
uh, the general public, which is my point. So this podcast is separate and apart from that. I'm appealing to the general public to almost try and attack the problem from that angle, to try to educate from that angle because I'm in the trenches. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a regular individual that's in the trenches. I'm not a lawyer. <clears throat> I'm just a, a, a business owner that's in the trenches dealing with the problems, solving the problems, and realizing what's wrong and seeing what took, takes place and trying to rectify both for the defendant and now I'm just trying to educate the public on what is taking place behind the scenes. Things that they're not aware of. I mean, a lot of games, too, are played. When they hand over these, uh, these hard drives for discovery, they put a ton of bloatware on them. And that's just to confuse people. You know, somebody who's not really savvy with computers, they open that up. You get an attorney who opens that up. There's all kinds of zip files and subfolders and thousands, and then you've got to go through each one and extract it. A lot could be missed. If you're not thorough with that, a lot could be missed. Do you really think that's an accident? Do you really think that's not intentional? Of course not. It's 100% intentional. Because unfortunately, a lot of the attorneys are not going to go that deep. They're not going to dissect it. And that's one thing we make sh certain happens. When we come in and we join the team, I personally guarantee there's not one stone that will be left unturned. Whatever's there, we're going to find it. We're going to go through it. We're going to pull it apart. And you have to. It's not even something that I'm trying to say, oh, you know, we do that. We... You just need to do that. As a defendant, you need to do that. And a lot of defendants just aren't even aware of it. You know, before I got involved in this, I wasn't aware of what took place and how this, uh, these, the information was handled and what had to be done to pr prepare for trial and how the task could be monstrous depending on the amount of discovery. You're just not aware of those things. And if the attorney's not keeping you in the loop, you're just not going to be aware of them. You don't know what's on the discovery. He could just tell you, ah, oh, there was only these items, but you don't know. You need somebody checking that. You need somebody pulling it apart. And, you know, that's where we come in. I, I've had a lot of uh, clients, the, the attorney's actual clients, then call me on the side and thank me. Because they knew, you know, we're fighting on their, on their side. And it's just a matter of making certain that they get the best defense possible. That's all it's about. I don't care if it's me. I don't care who it is. Whoever the defendant is, just make sure they're getting the best defense possible because you're going up against a very strong opponent regardless of the organization you're dealing with, whether it's federal, state. You're dealing with a very strong opponent. You got to make sure you have a team who's up to par for that because you have so many things against you. All the things I've laid out throughout these podcasts are going against you. You're, you're fighting an uphill battle. And you're not innocent until proven guilty. You're just not. You're guilty, now prove your innocence. That's the reality. And it's a stark reminder of how the responsibility falls on the general public. They need to get this system back to what it was initially intended for. I do believe the forefathers had the right idea. I do believe it was in the interest of the people. And then what happened was what always happens. Human nature kicked in. People tried to manipulate things to fit their own agenda. Individuals in power who don't possess a strong moral compass factored into you know how things developed and how things changed. Target, targeting individuals, all these things created this giant mess of the system which we're faced with now. And there's so many things to fix that I just feel it's, I don't want to say impossible, but it's improbable to get all these things fixed on that kind of level. That's why my focus is for the public because it really doesn't matter what they do. If the public stays strong and the jurors or potential jury pool that is going to serve has a basis of what their true responsibility is as written in the Constitution, it really doesn't matter what they do during trial. If you're not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant has a good shot. And that's all you ask. And, I, you know, I've hinted at it before. If somebody's guilty, it'll play out they're guilty. That's how it goes. But if 
the other side has to jump through hoops to try to connect these dots and, and come up with these far removed equations to make some kind of connection to prove their case. That alone needs to tell you something's wrong. It shouldn't be that convoluted. If somebody's guilty, it should not be that convoluted. And if it is, then you don't have beyond a reasonable doubt. Even if they are guilty, let's just say. And it's such it's so far removed and so hard to prove. And part of you is like, ah, that's kind of far-fetched. There's reasonable doubt. You cannot convict that person. And again, you're not saying they're innocent. That's why it's either guilty or not guilty. You're not saying they're innocent. You're not there to say they're innocent. You're just there to say, well, they're not guilty. Based on the government or based on the state or based on whoever presented the case, they didn't present their case beyond a reasonable doubt, so I cannot find them guilty. They're not guilty. In your mind, you may feel the person's guilty, but if you have any shed of doubt, you cannot convict them. This isn't find them innocent. This is find them not guilty. And that's really what I wanted to kick around today. The whole plea concept really stuck out because I was reading article after article how, you know, this is a, a, a reality. People are pleading that are innocent. So to the public, next time you see somebody pled guilty and you get all these big headlines from the agency where they're releasing press releases saying, yep, they're guilty, see they're guilty, they're pleading guilty, don't buy into it. Read between the lines. Read what they were facing versus what they took and the risks involved. That's what you need to weigh. Before you have this person convicted in your mind simply because they pled guilty, know all the facts. Then make your, your case. And uh, I just want to, before closing out, I want to thank um, the guys at Ruckus Radio because they read my response, as I mentioned in my other episode. They read my response to that article. And I was glad they even reached out to give me an opportunity to respond. So I'm, I'm happy with the way that played out. And also I thank all the subscribers and those who were supporting this platform and those who are promoting it. I appreciate it and hopefully the job gets done where more and more listen to it and we start changing the tide a little bit. Until next time.